Tonight, the FCC approves new broadband rules. How's this going to change the internet forever? Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 88 for Thursday, May 15th, 2014. I'm Jason Howell. Let's get right to the top story this uh, on this afternoon. We may all remember today as the day that the Federal Communications Commission changed the Internet as we know it. The FCC voted in favor of a preliminary proposal to allow Internet fast lanes with a 3-2 to two vote while asking the public for comment on whether the commission should change the proposal before enacting final rule, rules later this year. The FCC's notice of proposed rulemaking setback in 2010 addressed network neutrality, the concept that internet service providers need to treat all internet traffic equally, even from competitors. Those rules prevented ISPs from blocking content outright, but allow ISPs to charge third-party web services for a faster path to consumers. Those net neutrality rules were struck down in a federal appeals court ruling in January. The new rules are, again, still in proposal. And joining me to talk all about the complexities of this story today is Steve Kovac, Senior Editor at Business Insider. Welcome, Steve. Hey, thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's good to have you back here. So today you co-wrote an article about this FCC proposal, and you say right off the top that it's likely to change the internet as we know it. So let's start with the rules that the commissioners voted on. How might things change if these rules are enforced? Yeah, the uh, biggest uh, thing to pay attention to is here now that internet content companies, and you know, we always use the example of Netflix, so I'll use that too, but it even counts uh, companies like you guys at Twit. And, and they have the option now to pay uh, for these so-called fast lanes where they pay the ISPs directly so their content uh, gets priority over the rest of the content on the internet. And the reason why that has people kind of up in arms uh, lately is because uh, you know, when someone comes up with a new startup or the next Netflix or the next Twit or the next Business Insider or whatever bandwidth heavy, uh, you know, content uh, delivery system over the Internet, uh, it really it's going to be tough for those people to afford to pay uh, the ISPs for direct access to customers on those on those ISPs networks. Um, and so. Right now, it, it's going to allow, uh, you know, those behemoths that are already established, Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, HBO Go, they can afford this. They're fine. They're not worried. And they're going to be able to get big. They're big now, and they're going to be able to get bigger, which uh, will damage competition later on because they're going to have that advantage over some scrappy upstart who's trying to disrupt Netflix or disrupt Facebook or something like that. And that's what has people worried. Right. Now, the next step is public comment, and that's including whether or not the FCC should ban paid prioritization. Why didn't the commission just vote to ban it? I think this is just to uh, kind of save face a little bit. I think it's already a decision that's been made. We saw the vote today. Sure. Um, it was 3-2, so it's a very partisan vote. Um, you'll notice that one of the commissioners is an ex-Verizon uh, executive. Uh, another one used to uh, Wheeler uh, used to work for Comcast. Uh, he's the he's the chairman, mm -hmm. and so you know there are already these ties to the industry um, when they're supposed to be serving the public interest. Uh, a lot of people uh, tied to the FCC um, already have very deep roots in the companies who are really trying to battle this. Um, so this is kind of safe face to say, hey, we're listening to you. We're going to put this up for public comment for a few months. Um, but, you know, the cynic in me says it's not going to really do much unless, I don't know, something crazy happens and we really raise the big stink. Yeah, it's hard to not be a little cynical ab about this. And actually, this this statement right here, speaking of Tom Wheeler, who's the FCC chairman, as you said, he said in a statement before voting, quote, there is one Internet, not a fast Internet, not a slow Internet, one Internet end quote. What, what does he mean, especially if fast lanes are actually allowed? What, what does that statement even mean? Yeah, it runs counter to yes. everything we just heard today. Um, so, you know, they did throw, they are trying to play both sides here and they're saying, okay, uh, someone can come in and pay for this fast lane. But on the other hand, ISPs aren't allowed to go in and uh, deliberately slow down others. So, you know, that's that's there's no restrictions on anyone else. So I can start a new startup or, you know, they're not going to slow down Business Insider. They're not going to slow down Twit. 
but uh, the people who pay will still get that faster access. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like that old saying at Animal Farm, like, you know, not, but if you apply it to the internet, you know, some uh, people are going to be treated more equally than others. They want everyone to be treated equally, but if you pay, you get a little bit uh, more preferential treatment. Just a little bit extra. Uh, now, speaking yeah. of that, many in the tech sector uh, have been rallying against this prioritization. They're saying smaller companies, like you were saying, startups with less money are not going to be able to compete with larger companies that can pay for that fast access. But uh, about this baseline service that everyone gets, is that going to be good enough for most? Or, I mean, can, can we just assume that it's going to be pretty pretty low level? And uh, as, as you say, the people that are paying... Uh, get a right. significant advantage. Well, you, well, you look in the near term, it's going to be okay. And, you know, they're going to let things kind of exist as they have been for at first until they figure out ways to favor. And also keep in mind, a lot of these ISPs own their own content mm -hmm. and uh, until they can figure out a way to favor that as well. Um, and, and then you just look at the overall uh, infrastructure spending these ISPs have, um, and that's actually been declining. So the, the rate that these companies are investing in speeding up our connections and giving access to poor areas where they really do need broadband, that's declining. And so, you know, it's not going to be an immediate effect, but I'm looking down the road, I'm looking 10, 15 years down the road, while our economic competitors uh, in Asia and Europe and so forth, they're getting faster internet. Yeah, that chart you're showing right now, mm -hmm. um, you know, I posted that yesterday, they're, they're kicking our butt. And it's because they're investing heavier than our ISPs are right now, our private companies. And so the real answer is, I think, is to give it the uh, broadband internet, that Title II recognition. Um, that's what the real net neutrality advocates want. And that will treat it more like a public utility um, and it will make it easier for you know poorer areas to get access uh, to broadband internet. And it will make it'll keep the price low because this, I mean, this really is about freedom of information and, yes. and entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism and so forth. Um, and it's, it's dangerous, and especially down the road. Yeah, and ISPs do not want this uh, to end up in, in, in that direction, as you're saying. Now, Netflix is already paying both Comcast and Verizon for better access to their networks. That's known as a peering agreement. Wheeler says this is... Uh, quote, a different matter that is better addressed separately. Today's proposal is all about what happens on the broadband provider's network and how the consumer's connection to the Internet may not be interfered with or otherwise compromised. That's his quote. Uh, is it a different matter, do you think? It's similar but different. And he's yeah. right. The, this, the Netflix thing is the peering thing. Uh, they were paying a third-party company called Cogent to peer through Comcast. And then they realized, okay, well, uh, we can pay Comcast directly. Uh, one source told me uh, that Netflix is actually getting a better deal by paying Comcast directly. I don't know if I believe that. Um, and Comcast has kind of hinted at the same thing. Um, so that's a, it's similar but different. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're seeing also wireless carriers kind of get into this. Uh, AT&T announced uh, sponsored data during CES this year. And that's where essentially uh, a wire, you can pay to have your content delivered wirelessly uh, to AT&T devices and that content uh, won't count against um, a user's data plan. Right. And so that's just another way of preferential treatment uh, of content delivered wirelessly, which will become a much bigger issue once we start getting all our data wirelessly. Sure. Now, uh, looking for the glimmer of hope here, uh, these rules are based on Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act, which actually grants limited authority to the FCC for promoting uh, competition via the net neutrality rules. It's entirely possible that what Wheeler sees as, you know, he said an invitation for the FCC to act here could actually lead to a congressional draft bill that takes the FCC's authority away. How likely is that outcome, would you say? That, I'll be honest, I'm not too sure how likely that would be, but mm -hmm. I would love for that to happen because once Congress gets involved, uh, then we have a bigger voice. The FCC, of course, isn't necessarily afraid of not getting elected next uh, next cycle, but your congressman sure as hell is. Yeah. And so uh, if it is in congressman's hands, uh, we're, we w it, it'll be like the SOPA thing all over again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we won on that one um, and it gives us a better chance. I would love to see that happen. Yeah, I think a lot of people would, uh, particularly in the tech sector So uh, that, yeah. that, you know, that are covering this. So uh, thank you so much, Steve, for coming on yet again. Nice, nice deal with it and like it. Uh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> where, uh, where can people follow your awesome work online? 
Sure. Um, uh, the tech section of Business Insider is businessinsider.com slash SAI. And I'm on Twitter at, at Steve Kovac. Awesome. Thanks again, Steve. We really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye. Take care. All right. Now on to the tech feed. So uh, you thought we're done with the FCC. You were wrong. Also today in Federal Communications News, uh, the FCC voted three to two to approve a framework to sell more broadcast television airwaves. Set for 2015, the plan limits how much spectrum the two top players, AT&T and Verizon, can buy and leave some of the new spectrum for smaller outfits like uh, Sprint. Broadcasters can voluntarily sell airwaves, uh, airwaves and then take a cut of the proceeds. The broadcast industry in general does not favor the auction. And Dennis Wharton, a spokesman for the National Association of Broadcasters, said, quote, the order today threatens diverse programming sources and diminishes a vibrant free and local news entertainment and an information source for millions of Americans who can't afford $200 a month for pay TV and broadband bills, end quote. The vote was strictly on political party lines, yet again, with the two Republicans opposing the plan, stating it limited competition. Minnesota signs the first smartphone kill switch law. Starting on July 1st, 2015, all smartphones sold in Minnesota must be, quote, equipped with preloaded anti-theft functionality or be capable of downloading that functionality, end quote. There was no specific definition of what anti-theft means, just that the user would be able to remote, uh, remote disable or remote wipe the phones if stolen. It is estimated that nationally one in three robberies involve smartphones, according to the FCC. Now, most smartphone makers have plans for some sort of remote lock or memory wipe before next July. This law also criminalizes buying used phones for cash and not complying with new record keeping requirements. The wireless industry has argued that smartphone anti-theft laws are unnecessary due to software like Find My iPhone and Android Device Manager. If you have an LTE device on AT&T, your calls are still falling back to 3G technology, so they don't sound as good as they could. That's what AT&T's new service, HD Voice, is all about, improving the sound quality of calls between two supported devices using its new VoiceOver LTE service. After some delay, AT&T announced that those subscribers with a supported device like the Samsung Galaxy S4 Mini will be able to hear a noticeable difference in their call quality thanks to the way voice conversations are transmitted via IP technology as opposed to traditional circuit switched connections. Mark Gurman at 9to5Mac also says that people briefed on Apple's plans are pointing to the possibility that iOS 8 and the iPhone 6 might also support making calls over AT&T's LTE network. AT&T's Volt and HD voice services launch in Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, and Wisconsin on May 23rd with a broader rollout taking place in the coming months. And starting today, the country's four big wireless providers, wireless news uh, all over the place today, AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, and Verizon will officially route exist or text addresses to 911 uh, to your local police. With that said, it's hard to say whether your local police department can receive or respond to these texts. Each call center must decide how and when to allow text to 911. There are financial and logistical issues to work out as well since they are not real-time texts they could experience delivery delays, and there are no guarantees your emergency text will make it through. And if it doesn't make it through, the sender should receive a bounce back message. But that right there tells you all you really need to know about the reliability of using text for 911, doesn't it? And in Google Glass news, the University of California Irvine School of Medicine is issuing a pair of glass to all of its students. Irvine will be the first medical school to fully incorporate glass into its four-year curriculum. Its first and second year students will use the device in their anatomy and clinical skills courses, while third and fourth year students will wear glass during their hospital rotations. The university says it's found glass helpful in pilot tests that it has conducted in operating rooms, intensive care units, and the emergency department. And finally, uh, will the next step in room service include a champagne delivery drone? At the posh Casa Madrona Luxury Resort in Sausalito, California, just outside of San Francisco, that's what you get, with rates starting at $25,000 a night. Wow. The mansion suite is a restored 1865 home which can sleep 24 people. The drone, complete with custom name badges for the hotel, was unveiled at the mansion's grand opening last week and can deliver up to three bottles of premium bubbly alcohol delivery, showcasing the true undeniable power of what drones really can do for us humans. This is important stuff, people. 
and now I'm thirsty. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to this show at twit.tv slash TN2 and write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. Don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, tomorrow, and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Jason Howell. Thanks so much for watching. Ah! Ooh, ooh, ooh. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.